253. Two. Stanley's going to lead us in that song. And after that, uh, Brother Eddie Palmer, would you word our prayer for us, please? How shall the young secure their heart and guard their life from sin? My word, the choices rules impart to keep the conscience clear. To the conscience Open your Bible now to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. Last class, which was two weeks ago, we studied chapter 33, where Ezekiel was told he would be a watchman to the house of Judah and would explain to them their sins, and he did so. Now, when you get to chapter 34, the chapter is about shepherds and about the shepherds of God's people. And uh, it is explaining who is responsible for putting them in the situation they're in. So if you will, let's, tonight we're going to begin with verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 6 uh, as we see them as the shepherds of God's people. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for the beast of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Now, as we begin to look at this, one of the first things that you will notice in looking at this is, who are the shepherds of the children of Israel? Who did God expect to guide and direct these people? Okay, the priests were supposed to, because they're supposed to seek the law of the Lord in his mouth. Who else was supposed to guide these people? The prophets? They were supposed to deliver a current message to the people and tell them what they needed to do. Who else was supposed to be guiding the people? The elders, but uh, kings, okay, elders, of the, the heads of the families and the kings. And if you notice with me, there's a lot of parallel between the book of Jeremiah and the book of Ezekiel. 
And the reason there's a parallel is because Ezekiel speaking to the captives who are in Babylon, Jeremiah speaking to the people who are left in the land of Judah. I want you to, for just a moment, flip back to the book of Jeremiah with me. First of all, to chapter 5. Let's look at verse 31. I'm going to just take three or four verses here and see if I can uh, make a good point here. Jeremiah 5, verse 31. He said, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? What kind of leadership did they have? Sorry? People who had no respect for God, they had no respect for their fellow man. They didn't care about them. Turn over with me to chapter 10 now. Let's look at verse 21, chapter 10 of Jeremiah, verse 21. Because, again, I say there, there's a parallel here. And he says, For the shepherds have become dull-hearted and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks be scattered. He says they are dull-hearted. What does it mean to be dull-hearted? Stupid. <laughs> Brutish. Okay. They don't care. There's, you know, if something's a dull, like a knife, it won't cut. It has no ability to do it. They're dull-hearted. They really don't care about God's people. One more, and then I'll go on. Let's go to chapter 23. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Jeremiah 23, verses 1 and 2. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for all your evil of your doings, says the Lord. Now, um, what you find in those passages, and that's not all. You could go to chapter 50, verse 6. There's others. Um, all you have to do is just search for the word shepherd in the uh, book of Jeremiah, and it just pops out at you all the way that they're doing. Um, but these are the leaders of the people, and they're not leading as God would have them to lead. And so when we go to, back to Ezekiel 34, he says, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now, when you prophesy against someone, what's that doing? Like you're prophesying against Edom or against the Ammonites or the Moabites. It's, it's a condemnation. Now, you're telling them what you're, they're doing wrong. There's a condemnation of these shepherds here. And uh, so he says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Now, that is an important idea. We elect people to be public servants. And I, I, that almost is humorous, isn't it, to say they're public servants. What are those elected supposed to do? Serve us. In other words, that's what they were elected to do. In most cases, what do public servants do? Serve themselves. And so you exactly see what's going on. He says, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. And then he's going to explain what he's talking about here in the latter part of verse 2. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And verse 3 you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The first part of verse 3 talks about all the things that they did for themselves. How did they view the sheep? I mean, just look at verse 3. How did they view the sheep? They were there for their consumption. Whatever they wanted, whether if you, and if you sort of notice, what does a sheep provide? Provides milk, wool for clothing, meat to be eaten. And what were they doing with these sheep? 
They were consuming them rather than feeding them. And uh, so he goes on then to say there's something else in verse 4. The weak you have not strengthened, nor healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. Now, I'm going to pause there at this point. The role of a shepherd is to make sure that the flock is fed, but then they're also supposed to make sure that the flock is cared for. What happens if a sheep gets sick or injured? What's the shepherd supposed to do? Nurse them back to health. That's the role that a shepherd has. He said, you've not healed those who were sick, bound up what was broken, nor have you brought back what was driven away. Now, when we were back in Jeremiah, we noticed that they had driven some away. And um, somebody who is not concerned about a sheep may say, well, that one over there is just giving me a whole lot of irritation, so I'm just going to run him off. And their view of the sheep is, you're not worth anything to me unless you're giving me something. And so there were some that were driven away, but then there were also some that were lost. Sheep are notorious for wandering off. You know, Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned aside to his own way. Uh, everybody just goes their own direction. And uh, it's amazing how that sheep can find themselves being lost. Now, have you ever had a child that's getting enjoyment and having fun at doing something, and they're a group going over here, and then the group goes over here, and then goes over here? Where's mom and daddy at? Next thing you know, they're a long way away. Well, sheep also can do that, and what the shepherd ought to be doing is what? Tending the sheep. That means you ought to be watching over them. But what happens if you have one that goes astray? Do you remember what Jesus told in the parable in John chapter 10? You know, uh, about those that were uh, the 90 and 9. And then what does he do for that one lost sheep? Goes and finds it. So um, the idea here is, is that they're not doing their job. They're just looking at the sheep as something to provide for them, but they're not providing even the basic care that is needed to be uh, given to them. But don't you know the last part of verse 4? But with force and cruelty, you have ruled them. The idea of ruling with force and cruelty is something that's well known in the Bible. Particularly, you think about the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 1. You remember in verses 13 and 14, when the Egyptian, their taskmasters were ruling over them, it says they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field. All their service they made them to serve was with rigor. Uh, they just made it tough on them. Uh, have you ever worked in a job somewhere where your supervisor just seemingly enjoyed making your life miserable? I remember the first job that I had out of college. I worked in a bank for six months. There was a lady who was my immediate supervisor, and I believe she got up on the wrong side of the bed every day. And I really believe it was her goal in life to make Tony miserable uh, because she did. She was very successful at it. Uh, her, she's passed on now, so bless her heart. She's, she's, not, she's not here to, to bother anybody. But it was, it was awful. Well, here he's talking about the force and cruelty that you have ruled them. Now, uh, I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want to just look at verses 2 and 3. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Because there's some admonition given here for those who would serve as elders of God's flock. He said in verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, now listen carefully to verse 3, 
or the latter parts of verse 2 and then 3, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. What was Peter concerned that some serving in that capacity might do? Rule, well, ruling is, is what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Look, look carefully at the end of verse 2 when he says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Think about that for just a moment. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. What is their purpose for serving? Are they serving themselves? Or are they serving the flock? Or really serving the Lord, guarding his flock? You see, that's an important part. And then when he says, not as lords or nor as lords, but being examples to the flock. When you think about being lords, I think about the parable of the unrighteous stewards. You remember the master left the steward in charge. He goes away and he comes back. And when he comes back, what's he doing to the servants? Beating them. And uh, he's treating them like they are his for his own pleasure, and the master was truly disappointed at that steward because of that. Well, you have, what Peter's trying to impress upon, and he himself served in that capacity, if you look at verse 1, and he's trying to say, you don't look at it as your flock, you look at it as the Lord's flock, and you're serving them, and you're trying to be examples to them to show them how they ought to live. So, when you go back to Ezekiel chapter 34 and he says, with force and cruelty you've ruled over them, that's the exact opposite. Now i got one more passage in the New Testament before we go on. Turn with me to John chapter 10 for just a moment. John chapter 10. And let's look at verses 12 and 13. John 10, 12 and 13. And Jesus is making the point, and we will observe more later as we go through the rest of this passage here, the fact that Jesus is the good shepherd, but he's contrasting being a good shepherd with those who are not good. And he says in verse 12 of John 10, but a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep, and scatters them, the hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Does that tell you a little bit about the problem? Is what's a hireling? What is a hireling? You hire him to do a job. And uh, let me ask you a question. If you're, you own a business and you hire somebody to do a job for you, who's going to do the better job, you or the guy you hire? You are. Why? your business, your care, you've got investment. You, you're worried about it yourself. A lot of times, hirelings come along and they just say, oh, I'll get just enough to get by. Well, here comes a wolf. He's like, I'm not going to get eat up by that wolf. Let him have the sheep. He's not going to care about the sheep. It's, it, to him, he has no investment in it whatsoever. Well, that's the kind of problem you have here in Ezekiel chapter 34. You have men who are not concerned with the benefit of the sheep. And that tells you a lot about why the children of Israel are where they are. It's because all they have been concerned about is, how does this affect me? What are these people going to bring to me? And uh, I think about people today. You think about Mr. Putin over in Russia. Uh, how many lives have been destroyed because of his desires to expand that nation. I mean, just untold numbers of people in Ukraine, but he's also had a lot of his own soldiers killed who were not ready to go into battle and still not ready to go into battle. And because of that, you have people who are just self-motivated. He's going to have plenty of food on his table. He's going to have plenty of comforts for himself, but he's not going to be able to uh, he's not concerned about those with whom he's causing their lives to go astray. The thing with a sheep going astray, uh, Peter, he put him in a real crowded place, dizzy place, dizzy world where I said he got away from us from dizzy world. I thought he was going crazy. That's a big part of me and me and you, and they'd be lost. Yeah. 
yeah, there, you don't have to be very far away when there's a big crowd to be lost. And, uh, and we do live in a society today that's so busy, it's hard to tell where everybody's at and what they're doing and where they're going and what, you know, and the concern that you have to have for them. Well, I want you to notice the result here in verse 6. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. Now, what Brother Leonard just brought up, I wanted to bring that in to, he said, you know, Evie was about to panic because she couldn't see Stephanie somewhere. The case that you have here is nobody cares that they're lost. No, that's what I'm saying. These people don't care. They don't care if somebody's lost. Now, um, obviously, we've got to bring that to the modern day today. Do you think there are congregations where people are that no one cares where they're lost or saved? Absolutely. No one's watching for their soul. No one's trying to guide people in the right direction. That just tells you a lot about the concern that some people have or do not have uh, and what he is trying to talk about here. Well, let's pick up with verses 7 through 10 because he's going to now address the shepherds and say, you are accountable for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for the beast of the field, every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock, but my shepherd, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more, for they, I will deliver my flock out of their mouths, that they no longer may be food for them. Now, one of the things that I think is significant here, you know he's saying, okay, shepherds, you've done wrong, and because you've done wrong, I'm taking the sheep out from under you. But look with me particularly here at verse 10. I want you to notice a phrase that he's going to use in verse 10 because of the importance of it. He says, I will require my flock at their hand. If you go back to chapter 3 and you go to uh, verses 18 and 20, and you go to chapter 33, the previous chapter we just studied, verses 6 and 8, he talked about holding someone accountable, and he said to the watchman, he said, if you don't give them a warning, he says, your, their blood I will require at your hand. In other words, he's saying basically you are responsible for them. That's important, isn't it? To say that I am going to hold you accountable. Does God hold shepherds accountable for the sheep? Well, here in the case, he's giving the picture here. He said, you didn't seek for them. You didn't search for them. You didn't feed them. You didn't take care of them. Um, that tells you that if you don't do your job, God is going to hold you accountable. Let me ask you this question. Let's put it in the terms of the preacher. Does God hold preachers accountable for what they teach? Absolutely. That's James chapter 3. That's the job that God gives you. You don't, uh, James 3, 1, he says, you know, not to be many of you teachers knowing that we shall receive the stricter judgment. God's going to look at it. Those who are responsible for the souls of the congregation, are they going to be held responsible for those under their care? Yes. That's the reason why when the elders kindly try to talk to you and direct you, that's because they're concerned about the direction of where you're going. And uh, Rather than rebelling, you ought to say, thank you for being concerned about me. I know most of us don't like to be corrected, but that's a, a necessary fact of life. And if somebody's wandering off, to, for them to say, hey, we need you back. Now, you know, 
there's a, as Leonard pointed out, there's, if they're stubborn and obstinate, there's not much you can do, but uh, you make an effort to try to bring them back because you care about them. And that's what he's trying to say here is that you care about them. Well, if you don't have a good shepherd, God's going to take care of that. Let's pick up with verse uh, 11 and go through verse 16. For thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks for out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they are scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and all the inhabited places of the country." I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel, and they shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up what was broken, strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Now, Obviously, God is saying here, I am going to be a good shepherd. Now, for just a moment, drop down with me to verses 23 and 24 of this same chapter. He said, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ, the descendant of David. God said, I'm going to raise up. Now, for just a moment, turn to John chapter 10 again. I said that we'd go back here one more time. John chapter 10, let's begin at... Verse 1, and we could spend a lot of time here, but I'm just going to briefly uh, survey chapter 1. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he goes out, his own sheep... Uh, he goes before them, the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And it goes on to say, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. And then he says in verse 7, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And then he goes down to verse 11 and says, I am the Good shepherd. What do you think he's talking about in John chapter 10? The same prophecy that was given here in Ezekiel 34. Jesus said, I am that good shepherd. I am the shepherd that it cares about the sheep. Uh, the hireling's going to flee. The hireling's going to run away, but that's not going to be me. I'm going to take care of them. So as I go back here to uh, verses about verse 13 and 14. I'm going to bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries, bring them to their own land. That might sound like just a return from the captivity, but that's not true. That's not what it's fulfilled in. It's got to be fulfilled in Christ. He said, I'm going to feed them in good pasture. He said, I'm going to try to take care of them. But you look in verse 16, and everything that the bad shepherds were not doing then God is going to take care of them. He's going to, I'm going to bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick. But notice, he said, I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Those people who have been profiteering off of the flock, now they're going to understand God's going to meet them in judgment. And so that's going to introduce verses 17 through verse 24, where there's going to be a separation take place. And as for you, O oh my flock, now who's he talking to? He's talking to the sheep. He's talked to the shepherds, now he's talking to the sheep. 
Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will judge between sheep and sheep, between ram and goats. Now, um, when you have a flock, are there some of them good sheep and some of them bad sheep or some of them goats? You remember Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse, verse 31? Jesus told a parable. He says, a shepherd will gather before him all nations like a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He'll put some on the right hand, on the left hand. He said, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to judge between sheep and sheep. Are there some of the sheep that's good sheep? Yes. Are there some of them that are bad sheep? Yes. Well, let's notice verse 18. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture and to have drunk the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet? And he's talking about food and drink. Okay, here's the, the fat calf. Here's the fat sheep. He's going out here and he's eat the very best of the food. What's he done on his way back? trample down the rest of it so that the other sheep don't get anything worth eating. He goes to the uh, stream to drink, and he gets him a good drink of clear water, but while he's there, he just takes his feet and just muddies up the water. So what do the other sheep get to drink? Muddy water. He's giving a picture of people who are so entitled, they feel like they're, everything's all about them, that they don't even think about anybody else and how they're affecting them. And there, that's what some of the sheep were. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Uh, people who don't think that the Bible's relevant just haven't read it. I mean, it's, it's just as relevant as today. Well, let's look at what he goes on to say in verse 19. And as for my flock, they will eat what they, you have trampled with your feet, and they will drink what you fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed with your side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. Now stop there for just a moment. What picture is he giving to you of these bad sheep? They're bullies. They're not only messing up the pasture, messing up the stream, but now when it comes time, here's a, a poor weak sheep wanting to get something to eat. What do they do? They take their side and bump them and take the shoulder and bump them. You know, they're just, they're pushing them away. But God said, I'm going to judge between the fat and the lean. And obviously the lean are those who've been mistreated. And then he says, uh, Verse 22, therefore I will save my flock and they shall no longer be a prey and I will judge between sheep and sheep. Verse 23, and I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them, my servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. That gives you an idea of the way God is going to handle this. And this is going to be moving to the future. Now, I cannot help but think when the, Jesus came and taught, was the Lord concerned with people who were struggling and weak? The woman at the well? Was he concerned with people who were maybe the rejects of society, like the tax collectors, the sinners, the people who were left at the gate, like we'll study about Sunday morning, Acts chapter 3 at the gate, beautiful, here's a lame man, hadn't walked you know, all of his life. The Lord was concerned about those. Who did the Lord unload his wrath on? Okay. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, Matthew 23. And he talked about, he said, you make great pretense in your prayers, but you devour widows' houses. You see, they were looking at themselves as, this is all about me. He said, they love the chief places at the synagogue and at the feast. It's all about them. I think what Ezekiel's looking forward to is the time when the church was established. You have really two classes of people. You've got your religious people who are hypocrites, 
And then you've got your people who are struggling and having a difficult time, and they're like in Luke chapter 18. You remember the Pharisee and the tax collector praying, and the tax collector said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee just thanked God he wasn't like other men. And um, I think that's what he's looking forward to, and he's saying, I'm going to judge between sheep and sheep. I'm going to show you who's going to be taken care of. And Jesus is going to be that one in verses 23 and 24. Well, let's pick up with verse 25, and we're going to go through verse 31, and I think that's probably all we'll be able to cover for tonight's class. I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause the wild beast to cease from the land, and they will dwell in safety in the wilderness and in sleep in the woods I will make them and all the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season, and there shall be showers of blessing. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. The earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land, and they shall know that I am the Lord. When I have broken the bands of yoke, and deliver them from the hands of those who enslave them. And they shall no longer be a prey for the nations, nor shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and no one shall make them afraid. I will raise up for them a garden of renown, and they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Thus they shall know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord God. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God, says the Lord God. Now, let's go back here to verse 25. He said, I will make a covenant of peace. That phrase, the covenant of peace, is an important phrase in and of itself. Uh, I'm not going to take you to all of the passages, but turn over with me to chapter 37 for just a minute. Chapter 37, and let's look at verse 26. Chapter 37, verse 26. He said, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an, what is that? Everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. What is he talking about? The everlasting covenant. The New Testament. You know, if Jesus is going to be the shepherd, and the New Testament is his covenant, he said, I'm going to make an everlasting covenant with them. Uh, you could compare this if you wanted to, to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 and following. But I think at this point, now... Um, there's one other passage I need to carry you to before we run out of time. Let's go to Isaiah 54 for just a minute. Isaiah 54 and verse 7. Um, and the way that Isaiah puts it is just remarkably uh, well done here. Notice what he says, Isaiah 54, verses 7 through 10. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies, I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. So I've sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. But for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. The picture that he's given there with Isaiah is, God said, I'm angry with you, but how long am I going to stay angry with you? He uses the word for a moment. And then he compares it to the flood of Noah. And how angry was God with the world when the flood came? He destroyed it. But he said, what did he do afterwards? The floods dissipated. 
And God's favor came again. And so God said, I am making a covenant of peace with you. So if I go here and I look at um, Ezekiel 34, 25, he's talking about this covenant of peace that he's going to make with them. And he, that's going to be one of protection. That's the church. That's the New Testament. And that's God's protection. And since I'm out of time, let me go to verse 31, the last verse of chapter 34. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I'm your God, says the Lord God. If you want to put in the margin there, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 100, uh, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And so there's so much value there. Thank you very much. We'll pick up with chapter 35 next week. Okay. It's, uh, it's about time to start our Wednesday evening devotional service. I'd like to welcome everyone that's here tonight, and we're glad you came. Uh, we know it's cold outside, and you came, and that's, that's good. Uh, especially like to welcome any visitors that we have, and you're welcome anytime that you have the opportunity to be here at Bobby Branch. Our next service is Sunday, Sunday morning worship service at 9 a.m. Uh, if you'd like to get your songbook... The invitation song is song number 61. Song number 61. If you found that and marked it, the first song that uh, Eddie's chosen tonight is song number 48. Song number 48. And the reading before Jason's lesson is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And a few general announcements, the ladies' holiday dinner, all the ladies are invited to that. It is Thursday, December the 8th at 6 p.m. at Kimmy's Tea Room. There is a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board, and you need to sign up by Sunday, December 4th. That's this Sunday. Uh, the holiday fellowship meal for the congregation is Sunday night, December the 11th, after services. 
uh, soups and sandwiches are on the menu, but you're asked to uh, sign up on the bulletin board and indicate what you're going to bring. Uh, and please sign up by Sunday, December the 4th. That's this Sunday. Uh, youth announcements. There are several chances for edification listed in the bulletin for the youth. Uh, so if you are interested in any of those, please check the bulletin or the iPad uh, for that. CYC is getting very close, and you need to sign up by, you guessed it, Sunday, December the 4th. Uh, so sign up for that. Uh, the updates that I have to the sick that's listed in get those to Jason before Sunday since he's making an announcement. Now we'll turn the song service over to Brother Eddie Palmer. Anywhere with Jesus. Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we have this avenue of prayer to exalt thee for how great you are and how powerful you are. And we're thankful for all the things that we have. We're thankful for our blessings, for our home, and clothes, shelter, and the food that we have to eat, but most of all for the church. We're thankful for the church that you've established here, that we can we can come together and worship thee, that we can uh, be one as brethren to to know how great and awesome you are and to study another part of it from your word. Uh, we're also not mindful of those that aren't able to be with us. There's those that uh, would like to be with us as worship and are shut in or sick or, or aren't able to get out, and we pray that you be with those and comfort them, help them to, to be uplifted just like we are, and uh, we hope that they one time can once again can come back with us. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, for your Son who, who gave his life, uh, came to this earth and lived as an example to show us how to be a Christian and was crucified on the cross to shed his blood so that we can be saved through his, through his blood. 
Please be with all those in the world that teaches your gospel, that spreads your word with the ministers and the teachers, uh, those that's in foreign fields. May you uh, guide their steps to help them to do those things that you need us to, and that is to save the world as much as possible. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Help us to do those things that you want us to, to uh, shine our light ever more in the world that needs it, and to forgive us of those sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading tonight will be 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Good evening. What is this? This is the Bible. It's also known as the Word of God. In the scripture that was just read tonight, I want to read a few other versions that are a little bit different, just the first few words. One translation says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is breathed out by God. And the last one, all scripture is God-breathed. Some people will say that this is just a book, and they're right. It is a book. It's God's holy, divine book. And there's a lot of things that we can read in this book that would absolutely just blow our minds. You know, I teach my kids, there's no such thing in, as a story in the Bible. It's a true happening because it really happened. And these things just blow our minds. I mean, think about it. How many of you can walk on water? We read about two people in this book that walked on water. This book contains instructions for life, how to live this life. If you think about it, we are in the season of depression and sadness. We're in the holidays because a lot of times we start thinking about the people that are no longer with us. It makes us sad. And holidays is about family time. And sometimes families are difficult to deal with. So we've got this book right here that we can go to to figure out, okay, how do I deal with people that are difficult to deal with? However, there's a lot of people that limit God to this book. They limit him to these pages. You think about God. God's real. God is real. God is everywhere. You think about how powerful he is. We believe in the power of God because if we didn't, we wouldn't talk to God and pray to God and ask him to do amazing things like heal people of sicknesses that doctors have no idea how to cure. We believe in the power of God. God hears us when we cry. We think that we're, no one's listening. God hears us. God hears us when we're victorious. And I'm not talking about winning a ball game. I'm talking about when we are victorious over sin. When Satan has come at us with something that he knows is our biggest weakness, and we are able to withstand because we are applying what we're reading his word, God hears us when we have that, that victorious chant that we have beaten this sin that's come before us. God hears us when we're helpless. But in reality, are we ever helpless? Because God always wants to help. He's there. Whenever we're lonely, we're really not lonely. Because God is there with us. God loves us when we feel unloved and undeserving of love. A lot of people take God and confine him to paper and ink. Yes, we need this book. Yes, we need this instructions. But God is real. And God is really out there. God is really working in our lives. God's really doing things in our lives. And he really wants to have a relationship with us. He really wants to have a relationship with us. 
So when you think about the Bible, you think about God, you think, you know, people like, you know, th this is the limit of God in their life. They, they just read and that's it. That's all God is in their life. But God is real. He's really out there and he's really working in our lives. And he wants us to have a relationship with him where we believe that he is real. He's not just confined to these pages, but he's really working in our lives. And we're supposed to be working for him. So think about that every time you look at your Bible. Every time you look at that, say, yes, this is the word of God. Like it says, all scripture is God breathed. I open this and I read the words of God. The breath of God is hitting me. He's telling me the things that I need to know in my life. But he's alive and active and working in my life. He's not just confined to this book right here. So think about that. And like I said, God really wants to have a relationship with you. So if you're here tonight and you are not a child of God, you've never had your sins washed away. God wants a relationship with you. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross so that you could have a chance to come back to him, to get away from that sin, to become his child once again. Or if you're here tonight and you are a child of God or you were a child of God one time and you've slipped away, you've given up on God, you just don't know, just wondering why God's not in my life anymore because all these things are happening. He's still there. You just need to be looking for him. You need to reach out for him. You need to reach to him. And one way to reach to him is just when we sing the song, come forward and we will pray with you. So as we look at this book, just remember, God is real. He really wants a relationship with me and he's really working in my life. If you have any need, why don't you come while we stand and sing. Please bow. 
We come to you at the conclusion of this service, Father, just so thankful for the opportunity that we've had to assemble together and study from your word and fellowship with one another. We're so thankful, Father, for, for each person here. Uh, we ask that you just continue to bless us as you so richly have. We ask special prayer, Father, for the congregation here at Bobby Branch Church. Uh, just help us all, Father. Help us uh, strengthen the congregation. Help us all encourage one another. We ask you, Father, that you forgive us for whenever we fall short. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.